Sonic, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the first time you saw a guitar and you thought, this is cool? That's a good question. Um, I started playing the piano as a musical instrument and um, I think guitars were getting important when I started listening to Beatles and ACDC. So, um, always the same thing, but um, Beatles and ACDC were, were not working so well on the piano, especially ACDC. So, um, I, um, I got a classical guitar from my parents. I think it was the first grade of school, third maybe, fourth, and uh, it was a classical. So, nylon strings and uh, the typical beginner kind of guitar. And uh, I could convince my parents that uh, it had to be an electric very much sooner than. <laughs> and both of my parents, especially my father, were very supportive concerning making music for me. So they really supported me. And um, I don't exactly know what age I got my first electric. It was this Maya Fender lead copy. Um, yeah, and then, and then I could actually start playing in the school band the fifth grade yeah so this is how it were you were you standing uh, with your nose against the shop window somewhere to see what kind of guitars you thought were cool or? what always has been very um, appearing to me were Les Pauls like um, um, a friend of mine had a Les Paul custom copy and this guitar looked so cool yeah <laughs> so so yeah but the so that was your main influence yeah, I mean, I played this Fender Lead copy for a long, long time, and the next guitar I got was like a SG, again, copy from, I think, Aria. Mm -hmm. And then, my, maybe this is in the next questions, but uh, then my father actually started making guitars for hobby. Okay. But where did you grow up? Did you grow up around here? Or yeah, I grew up three minutes driving from here, so um, my parents moved here because of the airport. And uh, my father used to be, after he was a cabinet maker as a young, very young man, he went to military and became a pilot. And then yeah. he flew for Lufthansa. So um, being close to the airport was important. And so I grew, basically, I've, I've been here ever since. Around Frankfurt, always. Rotgau. Yeah. Just Rotgau. Okay, all the way. Yeah. yeah. But, so you, you just told me that what kind of work your parents did. So he, your father was a pilot? Yeah, after your he mother? was a, my, uh, well, my mother used her to, I don't know the English term, um, chimera laborant. Oh, yeah. And, but then uh, when they got married, she was taking care of the kids. Yeah. I think it was enough work. So how big was your family? How big was I have a sister. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The uh, five, fee five years older. Okay. Yeah. Good. You were married to um, a Dutch lady? Yes. As I heard. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit about her? Uh, well, besides that, uh, she's the best woman in the world. My of point course. of view, of course. <laughs> <laughs> she probably sees this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Um, I met her, I know her since a long time. We've been to school together, but not necessarily looked at each other. So okay. in this kind of sense that we <laughs> were looking for being a couple. Um, I th we are together since 89. Yeah. And we married in 99. So she was always in Germany? Yes, she was always in Germany because her father was also a pilot for Lufthansa. Oh, okay. So he was also a pilot in the military in Holland and flew for Lufthansa. Okay. This is not why we came together. We had these questions also. Like, are you together because both of your parents were the same, were pilots? But that's no. So y your family was a musical family? And what kind of music did you listen to uh, when you were a kid or around the house? Well, my father was from deeper Bavaria, so he was more into traditional music and was not necessarily a big fan of... Like the, the, the Yeah, no, no, but the not, he was not necessarily listening to rock and roll music. No. Yeah. But had was open to actually let me do. I, I think he did not like ACDC at all, no. but um, or Kiss or whatever I was listening to. He likes the Beatles, I think, but this is, I think, as hard as it can get for him. <laughs> okay. But he was the one 
who got you into guitar making or guitar? Well, uh, since he used to be a cabinet maker, like my grandpa and actually his grandpa as well. So it's like we've always been a woodworking family. So and he had a very sophisticated wood shop in his basement, and uh, I was already building toys with him okay. when I was a kid and uh, like ships or planes or how old were you then young kid okay. very young kid and uh, he started actually being interested in guitar making when he bought my first electric guitar and thought well this could be better for this amount of money because so I saw the guitar in your in your office yeah that was the one he made that was one he made um, I think that was like a third or fourth guitar he made and he gave it to me for my 18th birthday cool and uh, but I think I have I, I did play guitar which he built since I was 16 so, so and these he made were actually the first Hubers then yeah yeah, yeah. he's uh, yeah he's uh, he's to blame <laughs> You said the Beatles got you into playing guitar in ACDC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when did you make your first guitar that you would say, okay, this is really not just a hobby thing, but it's it's a real guitar? Well, that's, that it took a while. I made my first guitar in 93 in Spain, Formentera, Formentera, during this guitar building lesson, which I still highly recommend. And... Um, this was in a, in a time where I actually made an apprenticeship for being a cabinet maker, for being prepared for being an arti architect. architect. Okay. So I wanted to study architecture, so I had a waiting time because my school degree was not the best one, so there was <laughs> this waiting time to get a spot to go to study. So I made this um, cabinet making apprenticeship and in this time I was more focusing actually on being a musician, also because everybody wants, with 18, 19, wants to be a rock star, of course. Uh -huh. So I had a band, I played a lot, I actually did a tour in that time, and it looked like I really was trying to get more into music, but of course you have to have a real profession, yeah. so this kind of wanting to study was in my back back head like, okay you have to study to, 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 to have a serious profession but the dream of course was being a musician but during this apprenticeship of cabinet making I went to this guitar making school which again my father actually found about found out about and being in Spain in summertime and beach and live music and making guitars this was very very um, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very nice it trip. It came naturally, let's say. It came naturally and I was so hooked since then. And so that is where you got your info and your basic start? Yeah, besides, of course, the woodworking skills I learned from my father and the cabin, uh, my grandpa as well and uh, my cabinet making apprenticeship. The first skills about making a guitar in a proper way was from Terra Island, yes. And would you say that it was actually if you see your history that it was inevitable that you would be a guitar maker if I could really oh. see that back then already yeah no would you would you say that it's afterwards in hindsight that it's inevitable that you became a guitar maker there was no other way no other thing that you could have done, or would um, have done? that's a good question My, I mean since this guitar making course in 93 I really spent every spare minute into this so because it was hobby it was it's like when you like to BMX bike or surf or whatever and you're really hooked to a hobby you try to spend as much time on that as possible and then the next step is of course okay this is so much fun this is so great how maybe can I do even more with it so that means yeah maybe become a professional and I was very very lucky enough that I could show a guitar to Paul Smith already in 94 what did he say? Um, Again, I say always the same sentence, uh, since Paul is so honest, um, he actually asked me first, do you want a, honest an opinion. honest <laughs> honest opinion and an honest answer? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah why not? <laughs> so, so what do you want to do with this guitar? I said, well, of course I want a guitar maker. I want to be a guitar maker. I want to be a professional guitar maker. So no, 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 not good enough. So, okay, not good enough. So what can I do? Well, you have to do this, do this, do this. Okay, how... Who can teach me? And he said, really, I can. So, and of course, I didn't believe him. And um, it was early 90s, so no email, no 
no cell phones, so it was really sending a fax to Maryland with a couple of questions, and I got the fax back the next wow. two days. Wow. S short answers, just the right hint into the right direction. But could you say that you follow the PRS school of building, or would that be too much? Well, no, Paul really let me do my thing, but really gave me hints into the right direction. I think he liked also tease me a little bit in finding out myself and really... To provoke you? In a good way, yeah. in a very good way. So uh, constructive. Go this direction, do this. And um, and I was lucky enough to really be able to show him a guitar like every year, either at Musikmesse and I traveled with Ingrid to, to NAM in, I think, 97 to bring another guitar to show him and he invited us to um, to see the, the factory and uh, always a guitar, the next guitar with me, got comments and then maybe the woodwork improved and then he said, well the finish, why didn't you finish here, why did you do that? And he was really always to make the job right, finish the thing. So would you be, could you say that he was your mentor? Was it, Absolutely, I, I wouldn't be here without him. Wow. That's, okay. that's really for sure because I think I would not have had the... Well, my father was always into details, big time. But in the guitar business or in the guitar making, if, you, if you're if you making your first guitar and you spray your first clear coat, it all looks great. Even if it has... Even if it's... Uh, buffing was a nightmare. Find out about buffing and staining. And um, Paul always said, well, this here, you have to buff here, probably. I said, well, this direction, I cannot even sand in this corner. Yeah, Rick, you can. Go. Same. Okay. So the, this really um, pushing into making it as good as possible as you can was very important. I think beside making a good guitar or getting to the point where you can make a guitar, really making it as good and spending the extra hours and um, that was very very important. That was the most important lesson I think. I, I think also when you see a lot of products from small builders that they a lot of times they take uh, the easy road and they don't push themselves hard enough. W would you agree? I mean, saying that you would push yourself hard enough. I yeah, and I, I kind of spent so many extra hours. Also, in re when I started repairing, and I said, well, this repair will be, let's say, back then in Mark seventy bucks, and then you see, oh oh, way too much time already spent. But I always spent the extra hour, lo lost money on the job, but to make it right. So this is very important. And on other builders, I, well, I just, ca this, that's the message I have for everybody who wants to be a guitar maker, is just make it as good as you can. And if you see, it could be better, just try to make it better. Okay. Okay, I, I would say this concludes the, uh, the personal side of things. Uh, I would like to talk also about more uh, the freaky side of things for the for the nerds, guitar nerds. First question would be, why do you think that people choose your guitars uh, over some others? I ask this question myself a lot of times, and I'm very often very impressed to see how how dealers like you sell the guitars so well, and uh, obviously there's so many great guitars out there. And you will never hear me saying I make a better guitar than somebody else. I just can tell you that I really love what I do. It's my, again, it's my favorite hobby. And I think if you really do what you love, and if you really care for what you do, and you enjoy it, and you try to always get to the next level, and always be critical to yourself that well this was this next time I can in improve this and there's always the next level I think that's a big point to maybe make a guitar look like our guitars look yeah beside that I was or I am very very lucky to have a team like I have so it's not only Nick Huber making a Nick Huber guitar it's there are 10 people involved meanwhile. Not everybody is full-time, but we are. if we go to Christmas dinner, we are even 11. And um, to have this kind of team is it's great. Okay, so you just told me that you have 10 people working for you. Could you give me yeah. a short rundown of what they do? Yeah, um, well, let's, let's go on this. 
Um, there's Nickel, who is with me since he's with me the, the longest, and um, he is our best builder. He is really you can make make it out from A to Z, and he's he's our guy to make fancy inlays. He's with me since a long time. There's Marcus, who joined us after Nickel, who's with me since 15 years, and Marcus kind of concentrated on. <laughs> The department sounds like a factory, but he's really watching, sanding, staining, base coating, pore filling, together with Christine, together with Max. So that's Christine, Max, that's four. Nickel four. Then we have um, Clemens. Clemens, who joined us four years ago. And Clemens is, meanwhile, our guy to talk to people. Since I like to be as dusty as I can in the shop, and I'm not good at email and phone and business kind of things. Um, Clemens is there to answer emails, to be in contact with quite cool artists we have meanwhile and doing all this lots of paperwork and CITES documents and Fish and Wildlife documents and Lacey Act and export declarations and uh, so much uh, paperwork. So I'm very happy that he really worked himself into this and he's really good in that. And he's the guy to talk to the guitar players from from bands like Quellatak, Cancer Bats, Speed Stakes, you, you name him. And he's really their friend, so he's yeah. he's a good communicator. So I take him to every show. But you also play uh, in bands yourself, huh? that's what I... Uh... Yeah, I do. So should we finish up the team? Yeah. There's, um, there's Franco who is programming and designing, um, well, drawing the CAD, CAD programs, who is very important because I have no clue how to draw on a computer. I, um, then we have Andreas, who is mainly doing neck work, from rough neck blank to the fretted neck, who does all the neck work, gluing the truss rods, fretting the guitar, sending the fretboard radius, and so on. Who else do we have? We have my wife being the boss. <laughs> <laughs> like any married man would do. Right, so Ingrid is uh, watching the numbers and um, going to the ben bank and checking accountings and such and um, keeping me grounded. <laughs> um, did we miss somebody? There's Matthias who is coming in once a week, twice a week for when I need another light at the workplace or I need an extra plug to close to a machine or he pre solders the electronics pots and such, so that's Matthias. We have Kim who comes to the shop once a week to just clean up. And I'm sure. We have Sebastian still on the team who is a guitar maker who joins us for mainly sand and body work. I think that's it. Yeah, that's 10. I yeah, think that's yeah, it. Yeah. And it's me, so it's 11. Good. So do you have any construction style when you're building guitars that you follow? Do you like, a, like influences that you, that you have? I think we make a very traditional conservative guitar. So um, there's lots of influence of vintage guitars. There's obviously a lot of Paul's influences. And um, it developed into, well, if you repair, we repaired more than 400 guitars a year for wow. years and years and years. And I got work from Paul being the PRS service guy here in Germany and a few other distributions. And of course, musicians, hey, please refret my Les Paul, please glue my broken headstock, what, any kind of guitar and repair we did. And then you learn a lot about guitars. You see, well, I like this. I don't like this so much. Well, this neck broke off because there's not enough connection between neck and body. So building experience, basically. And this was a big lesson to, to, to take a look at so many guitars, screwed up, broken guitars, and find out why it didn't break, why does it feedback, why do I have to change the pickup, why is the string buzzing, so that was, okay. that was an important lesson. I, th I think you, you put everything into a basket and then make your own thing. Yeah, and that's what you do, actually. I think you, you make a uh, quite unique guitar. I mean, it looks maybe like something else, some some of the models yeah. do, but I think that's inevitable. But they, they have their unique uh, quality, I think. I hope that we got more and more into an own style. Yeah. And if you would now ask me to make a violin, I wouldn't change the body shape. 
it's the, it's a classical design and if you make a classical guitar you probably will not make it very weird looking it's a proven design proven shape and i'm not this design talent like an Uli Teufel is or Claudio Pagelli who really always come up with new ideas I'm just blown away by these kind of luthiers well, these, these that's are not niche, me. Uh, niche uh, brands eh, that you name I mean this this is that, more like a working guitar I would say no? that's yeah and, I mean those are really the Claudio and Uli are more artists and hand workers and I consider myself like more a guitar builder mm. I built practical yeah okay yeah. So how automated is your building process? Um, we have a CNC since quite many years. I think since late 2006 we're working with CNC. It took us a while to get into it and I'm very happy that I have somebody so talented in constructing and drawing and um, I think we're very good in making our own tools and fixtures and jigs now and um, it's not a secret at all that we use CNC and we will use CNC and want to use CNC as much as we can. Can I say can I say that CNC is used at the at the let's say critical points where precision is very important and people are used uh, where the labor and the love and the passion is is, is Yes. Important. I mean, I've hand carved so many tops and I've had many times bloody thumbs from just with a scraper Scraping, yeah. and little violin planes and it's a lot of fun to do this one time it's okay the second time it definitely sucks yeah. <laughs> the third time and the same with like in standard inlay like um, we're not doing them so much anymore but our dolphin inlays in the fretboard we hand cut them nickel hand cut so many dolphins and um, I think you should if this is a, a repeating standard option I think we're very we should make them by CNC because it's a backcoming thing again and again. But if you have some, if you have a unique one of inlay, let's get the saw and draw and pencil and then make uh, make it all by hand. I mean, that's fine. But like all these processes, which are again and again, and precise, of course. Yeah. Um, you saw it when you filmed it on on on, on the machine when we do certain. Like trustrod channels for a neck. Why should I do it with a hand router if I have a machine doing that? Yeah. Like I said, I try to get get the C in, involved as much as I can. Also, when you get to a number where we make, let's say, 20 guitars a month, it completely makes sense. And um, if somebody really wants a handmade guitar completely, there are still guitar makers out there using no CNC at all. There's Juha Rukangas in Finland who does a hell of a job with copy routers stationary routers and he's sta stating I'm not using CNC great yeah great. okay so how long does it actually take to create one single guitar in a row of 20 a month what is well, the what is the lead time on one well we try to make it in a five six week turn over like starting gluing up but this already recommends that the woods are there dried cut into sizes dried proven Everything is there, and then from gluing up to finish, we could do it in like six weeks. Okay. But the amount of orders behind it would say it's, of course, it's, it's very much longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what do you like most about your own guitars? I mean, I don't, I know you don't like to talk about yourself, but what do you think are the most characteristic and, and the best features of, of them? I, well, I think we have one unique component on every guitar we make and that's the neck joint I think this is really us and um, it's a practical maybe to some people also an odd looking heel but this is um, a result of a lot of drawing and uh, I think that that's a very personal thing beside that um, again personal taste I like our neck shapes a lot but you know, if you want to have a 17 millimeters flat, very fast kind of neck, this is not us. Uh, I would not even take the order for a 17 millimeters neck thing. But would you say that it's a, it's like a 50s style neck? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think there were some juniors out there, especially juniors, which I, I owned three. I still have one. And they had sometimes amazingly well-shaped necks, 
really nice and um, like organic feel to it. I like to have thick, deep necks, but I like to take off a lot of the shoulders. Not a V yet, but close to that. I think that makes a, a deep, very comfortable neck. But this is just my personal. Yeah. View. I mean, well, I, I think most people tend to agree because they never complain in the store because I we sell basically every Hoover we get within two weeks simply because people try them even a lot of people that never heard of, of your name yeah. and they never complain about the necks when when it's for instance Gibson or some white fat necks from PRS or other brands they tend to uh, talk about that you know sooner so they, they, they tend to want the thinner necks from these brands but but with with your guitars I mean it's never an issue the neck it's I mean, I think the um, Paul's necks are pretty good. A really nice shaped necks. I'm not too familiar with the new guitars anymore because I'm not repairing so much or I don't repair anymore. And um, I barely get a new guitar from Paul in my hands. On the trade of amazing, amazing work, amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. And um, same with Gibsons. I, I don't get to play too many other guitars which maybe I should <laughs> well maybe you shouldn't because I think it's also good to have your own vision and do what you think is good I mean it has been proven that it's a good vision Would yeah you yeah maybe it's maybe to focus on what you do your on your own maybe it's better than always look at something else I did that of course I did that in, in, in the early days and I tried to yeah like when I repaired and I tried to look as much as I can into other instruments and vintage and new ones and it's it's always the biggest fun is to go over the show and see new ideas, new work, new builders, young builders. Um, I think I'm now one of the older ones. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you uh, do you get influenced by new builders that you 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 mentioned some of the more niche uh, type of brands? Do you do you get influenced by them, or is it just nice to see? Uh, well, for me, it's looking up to these guys like Uli Teufel, Claudio Pagelli. They are. I think that's the art of guitar making. Mm. It's uh, and, and I have the highest respect of guys like I mentioned. Yuha Rukangas is an amazingly nice guy and builder, and they're so cool. There's um, you name them. Mm. There's so many Gerald Melancon, Tom Anderson. There's so many great guitars out there. Yeah, and uh, it's and to me the, the the nicest part is that all the guys who make a great product have more than enough work to do that's good mm. that's good to know okay yeah. one of the last uh, questions is uh, your uh, models have specific names uh, where do they come from uh, Ingrid Ingrid oh, was a, Ingrid was a ah. dolphin maniac uh, even the dolphin thing came because of Ingrid because she was a dolphin fan ever since and uh, we went once to Florida to get yeah, to swim with dolphins, to get involved a little bit in protection kind of things. And we like, just so much interested into dolphins, Ingrid especially. And there was a certain time where we even had bottle openers in the shape of a dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> so, and when I came up with my own guitar and I thought it had to have a logo, it, this is why it became a dolphin. So then Orca was a logical spin-off. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah. 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 And now we're working still on this uh, blue whale thing, which is a charity. So again, the whale theme, but um, we made different things. I, I mean, we had tiger inlays and uh, a wolf and Indian kind of inlays. So yeah, Japanese kind of things. What, what I thought was very funny when I heard the Krautster name uh, for the first time, because of course, a Kraut is like yeah. a, sort of a nickname. Exactly. For a German. Yeah. I think I think that is uh, that is nice that you have this tongue-in-cheek sort of thing, a uh, little bit of humor. I, I don't think that is. I, yeah, uh, that's a very important statement as well for myself that we don't take ourselves so serious. Yeah. I mean, we try to make a living of making guitars. That's great. We can make a living out of making guitars, and but it's not so. It's. It's making guitars, and uh, this is great, but we don't take ourselves so serious, and we always try to have some fun involved. Yeah. Like last measure, we have this Pemble kind of crowd star, which was just a joke guitar. So it's to make a little bit fun out of it. And yeah. the name, I think, was very self-ironic, 
internationally. So and uh, this was our project name for a while. I said, well, Crowdster, that's cool though. We had, didn't have the final name yet, and then we came to the point where, well, now it, the show is coming. Now we have to make a brochure. So let's keep the name. Yeah, we got it. I think it's very cool. <laughs> I think it's very cool name. So. Um, Last questions. Uh, what are you listening to right now? What kind of music? Uh, right now, I listen a lot to the new Queens of the Stone Age album. I don't even know what the name is, but it's it's very good. I think it's kind of not a secret that I like the Foo Fighters a lot. But since I did really also play this music a lot, I'm not listening to Foo Fighters so much anymore because I played a lot. Yeah, you know the music. Yeah, and um, I'm... Clemens sometimes really brings on new bands which play our guitars. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I can really get it hard. I like hard kind of... Red Fang and that sort of stuff. Yesterday we went to Red Fang on the concert. That was awesome, yeah. And uh, But again, if you... The Beatles still top top of the list. Would you okay to wrap this up? Would you play us some of your music? Well, as as much as I can. Well, thank you, Nick. Pleasure. Thank you for yeah. being here. Yeah, being a friend. <laughs>